Hi, I am Katrin Kanya. I am a medieval textile archaeologist. I am delighted to be part of Botanica Yarnfest this year. And I'm here to tell you a few things about spinning with the medieval hand spindle. So let's start with the very basic principle of spinning. Spinning means that you have fibers of a limited length and you want to turn these fibers into yarn of unlimited length. And the magic thing to do to get this yarn is add twist. The twist basically presses the fiber surface together. It acts like some kind of glue and this means that you can have an unlimited length. So as you can see you can do this twisting with your fingers but at some point well you need to store your yarn somewhere and also it is really really slow to do. So humanity invented an ingenious tool that was used for spinning throughout most of our history and that is the hand spindle. The hand spindle is very simple. It's a stick and a weight. So the spindle stick usually is spindle shaped so it tapers to both ends. That's the typical historical form of a spindle stick. And then you have a ball, the weight, and this is just put on the stick and you can fix it there by using a tiny little twist and a tiny little bit of pressure. And then it's stuck on quite firmly. And this, this is the tool that was used for spinning throughout most of human history for thousands of years. This is a bit different from the typical modern hand spindle and also the way that it was used in the Middle Ages is a little bit different from how most modern hand spinners use their spindles today. Now, we have a variety of shapes and sizes and materials for the spindle balls and a typical material for them is ceramics, clay, so these are a few examples. They come in all kinds of colors, clay colors differently. And if you do a primitive firing of the clay, you can turn any kind of clay black by so-called reduction firing. So you can get pretty random patterns here on your spindle walls. And this is made after a prehistoric example. So um, all very pretty. You also can find spindle walls that are made from glass and you can find spindle walls made from stone. And there's, as I said, there's a huge range of weights. There's different shapes, different sizes. Sometimes they depend on the area and the time. Sometimes they also, there's just a mix and you probably used whatever wall suited you best and what you were spinning right now. In addition to the spindle, which we always need for spinning, medieval spinning also uses a distaff, which you can see here, one of them. A distaff is nothing but a stick to put your fibers on because the technique that we can see and that we can reconstruct from both ethnographic sources and pictures that we have from medieval spinning they show a, a very distinct hand and body position. So we can reconstruct a spinning technique that was used that is very quick and very efficient and that is very reliant on the distaff because you just need that as your third hand to hold your fibers. Here's an example for a distaff, such as you can also buy in my shop. Um, it's a stick with a band on it to hold your fibers. So I have already mentioned that twist is what you need to make your yarn. And if you have modern people who spin, most of us just do it for fun because we enjoy spinning. 
it's it's a lovely pastime it's a very nice hobby it's a nice way to make yarn and most of us who use the yarn for something use it for knitting so there's of course exceptions but that's the typical modern use now if you're knitting knitters count the amount of yarn needed in meters or yards you the use the typical use for spun yarn for overall use is weaving and weavers count the yarns in kilograms so that should tell you we need a lot of yarn for making historical fabrics for making fabrics we're talking kilometers here and that's just for a square meter of fabric so since twist is the thing we need we want to introduce the twist really quickly and this can be done by having one hand always close to the spindle and keeping it in very quick motion and having the other hand at the fiber supply to control the flow of the fibers. So this is the technique that we can reconstruct for historical spinning, for medieval spinning. And just like with the long suspended spinning, when you have the spindle just hanging in front of you, after a time, you have, of course, have to wind the yarn onto your spindle and then you can go on. And this is really adding twist very, very quickly. And I will take a second distop in a moment and go closer to the camera so that you can see better what I'm doing. But I think you can already see that this is a, a very efficient way of making yarn. So this is one way to have the distaff. I like to have it fixed uh, beside me for presentations. You can also have the distaff under your arm so you can walk around with it or you can stick it through your belt and hold it under your arm. When I'm wearing modern trousers I often put it in my pocket with the bottom end and then tuck it under my arm. So. Here comes. I will go closer. I'm having the thread that a spindle is on hanging or going over my finger. So the spindle hangs here where I can flick it very easily. And the hand with the spindle does most of the work. It wanders away from the distaff and this provides the drafting motion and the other hand just controls the fiber flow. And I can do that by twisting and untwisting fibers. If the thread gets too thick, I untwist the fibers between my left hand fingers. And if it's too thin, I just add some more twist quicker. So it goes back to the thickness that I want it to have. I'll turn around and hopefully you will be able to see what I do with my fingers. So there's, ideally, there's not much happening in the left hand because the speed that I draft with, with the right hand, and the speed that the twist enters my fiber just works out to an even yarn. But I can do this little twisting, untwisting motion to control the fiber flow. And you see that the yarn curls up very quickly here. So historical yarns are usually much tighter spun than modern yarns and most modern spinners spin very softly compared to historical spinners uh, there's the main reason for this is probably probably the modern industrial yarn production because the modern weaving machines the industrial looms can cope better with yarns that is not curling up on itself as soon as you leave it a little bit of leeway to do so. However, 
this means that the yarn has other um, other properties. Yarn with more twist is usually quite a bit stronger than yarn with little twist. And if you're making fabrics by hand that take a huge amount of time, you want, of course, your fabrics to last as long as possible. And that means you want yarn that is as strong as possible. And that, in turn, means that you want quite a bit of twist. So when we compare modern fabrics to historical fabrics, we have this rather significant difference in twist. And twist is hard to measure. The easiest or the, the most... Um, the best way to measure it, if you want to know it exactly, is to untwist a certain length and then count the measure, uh, count the amount of twists that you had. This is uh, frowned upon if you try to do it with archaeological or historical textiles. So uh, there's um, another way to measure twist, and that is the so-called twist angle. So when you add twist to your fibers, they start to slant. You start out with all the fibers, in theory, aligned in one direction. And when you add twist, you start to get a slant. In this case, it goes in this direction and it will be impossible to see on the bad camera, uh, probably. Just look at some yarn you have at home to see it. So you get this slant and it goes either in this direction or if you twist the other way around, it goes in that direction. And because that resembles the middle diagonal in the letters S and Z, it's also called S twist or Z twist or Z twist for the Americans among you. Uh, and German. <laughs> so you can measure the angle of this slant to get a rough impression of how much twist your your yarn has and um, because I need that for my spinning when I do reconstruction work I have designed a, a little card I call it the little helper card and you can also get that in my shop and it has um, something to measure the spinning angle. It has centimeters and inches if you want to count wraps per something. And it also has this quick comparison chart where you can take a bit of your yarn and see how thick your yarn is. So you can measure the spinning angle and a lot of modern yarns have a spinning angle of about 10 to 15, maybe 20 degrees. Most of the historical yarns have an angle of around 30 degrees and in some cases it goes up to 50. However, measuring this angle is not without its pitfalls because A, it's hard to measure, B, Hand spun yarn is always a little inconsistent and you get different angles at different places. C. Your fibers are not always perfectly aligned as they go into the yarn and there's stray fibers on the surface so it can happen that you measure a different angle than the angle that your yarn actually has. And it also makes a difference who does the measurement and where you measure. So it's, it's just a rough guideline. Uh, what you can take away is that historical yarns were twisted more tightly than modern yarns. Now, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to ask them. You should be able to type them in the comment field and I will try to catch them and answer them. Otherwise, I'll just prattle on about random things about historical yarns and historical spinning. So, uh, 
What we also know is that the fibers were prepared. They usually were prepared by combing. We have cards only rather late in medieval history. We can find them after the first spinning wheels appear. And those are very early wheels. They are spindle wheels and they have nothing to do and look much unlike the modern small treadled spindle wheels, uh, spinning wheels that you are probably familiar with. So preparation by combs and that gives you limited length pieces of fibers that are nicely aligned and you can then dress those on a distaff like I did here. So this is just bits of basically top or roving, however you, you call it. Um, and those are put onto the distaff and they are held on with help of the band. They should be on the distaff firmly enough, held on the distaff, that they don't come off in clumps, the fibers but um, lightly enough that you can do drafting easily as you're spinning because you don't have a lot of power in your, um, in your fingers or in this setup. So whenever you have fibers that are really stuck on the distaff to your distaff band, that is um, irksome because, well, yeah, it, it just doesn't flow very nicely anymore. The speed with which people spun in former times is also something that is subject of a lot of debate, uh, also in, in academic circles, because of course it would be really helpful to know how long it takes to make a piece of fabric. But doing calculations on this is really, really difficult because it depends on so many factors. It depends on your spinning style, it depends on the fiber preparation, it depends on the loom, it depends on the weaver. So how long did it take to make a piece of fabric is a very hard question. And spinning times alone are something that is really a hot, hot topic. The last time I measured, and that has been a while, I should really do it again. I came at, out at about 60 meters per hour spinning with the hand spindle and this stuff. And that was not rushing it. That was basically work speed, as you could expect to, to, well, to sustain for a longer time. Possibly not for a full work day nonstop. But if you spin a few hours a day, that would be an entirely sustainable speed for me. And as I said, I should do it again and see what it is these days because it can change. It will only change up to a point, however, because at some, at some point you're just at your personal maximum speed. It's just like when you take up running and you, you get train from couch potato to runner or to hobby runner at first you will gain a lot of speed very quickly and you will make a lot of progress and then after a while the progress will taper off and you will have to invest a lot more effort to get much better or much faster and at some point you will have to invest a huge effort to get a bit faster maybe on a good day and it's just the same with almost anything else. And of course, also with crafting and uh, textile techniques. So as you learn, you get quicker, fairly easily and, and quickly. But after a point, you will have so much experience and so much practice that yes, you can go faster if you try hard, but the outcome might also not be so much better, so much faster or um, the quality might suffer. So um, sometimes it's said that yes, but people in medieval times or in prehistoric times, they learned how to spin when they were five years old. And if you learn it when you're 25 years old, you 
well, you lack 20 years of practice. Yes, you lack 20 years of practice, but how many years of practice do you need to be fully practiced? Um, do you really need 20 years? Isn't it enough to practice a year or maybe two? And then you have it and then you're at your, your final speed and that's it. So um, uh, a very hot topic. And uh, as you can notice one that is also a bit dear to me. So I have not caught any questions. Um, you still have the chance to ask me anything about medieval spinning and I will try to answer. As you can see, the yarn builds up nicely and as you can also see, I am having the cop not as you see it on many modern spindles right on top of the spindle but it's a bit detached and I wind my yarn so the cop is stable in itself. And there's several reasons for this. One of them is that you remember the whorl is just stuck on. So if I wind right to the whorl, um, eventually the yarn will push it off and that's annoying. The second reason is if I have this stick, um, I can use it to store my yarn on and that also only works if when I take the wall off I have a stable cop and you can even use the stick as a shuttle if you want to when you're weaving and now there's questions and I will catch those um, are you part of a living history group or do you work for a museum I do living history I usually do it as a demonstrator I'm not part of a group but um, I have been active for ages. Um, I started out when I was 17 and I have been doing it professionally for more than 10 years now. So um, I am hireable and I have worked for museums in, in different occasions. And a second question. Can you tell a bit about yourself? Are you an archaeologist? Yes, I am an archaeologist. I studied medieval archaeology in Bamberg uh, which is one of the few universities where you can study medieval archaeology and I have specialized in textiles basically right away and that's what I work in. So um, what I mostly do is I offer tools and materials for different historical textile techniques and spinning is one of them and it's, it's actually one of my favorite techniques and one that I do most or Yes, that I do most work in at the moment. Uh, but in my shop you can also find things about other techniques and you can also um, read all kinds of different stuff about what I do on my blog if you're interested. So I also do reconstruction work for museums uh, as part of my, my work. I have taken off my wall um, and I will put on another one now and I will actually put a smaller one on which is another very nice thing you can do with these medieval spinning spindles because at some point you will have so much yarn on your spindle that it doesn't turn properly anymore and if you put a smaller ball on then you're back to the glorious days of oh this goes really nicely. And this is another very nifty thing that these medieval spindles allow you to do. And there is another question. Do you also do weaving sprang or nail binding? Uh, yes, I do. Well, I don't do um, fabric weaving. I do um, narrow wares. So I do a little bit of rigid heddle. I do quite a bit of tablet weaving, especially for research purposes, trying to figure out a method that was used to weave without, um, without instructions, without a written pattern. And we are talking complex patterns without written pattern here. So on a, a twill basis. I also do sprang. Uh, I, I also teach tablet weaving and um, sprang and rigid heddle. 
I can do Nile bending, but this is, to be honest, this is the one textile technique that I'm really not in love with. So um, I try to, I don't do it very much. As you can see, this progresses nicely. And as you can also see, when I turned the distaff a bit ago, I did not fix it properly anymore. So it comes and nods at me when I pull. Um, I turned the distaff because, as you can see, hopefully, the fibers here are quite a bit longer than the fibers on the other end, where I spun first. And I prefer to have my fibers run out evenly. So from time to time I, I turn the distaff around. And then after a while, when I've worked my way up this, um, this fiber beard, then it's time to open um, the, the band and rewrap it a bit further upwards so that I can spin off more of the fibers. Someone asks if I have a favorite wall material, glass instead of stone, etc. Um, I don't have a favorite material. I have a favorite wall, but that's pro probably, or at least for part of the spinning, uh, that is probably what, because um, I just have that for ages and I've gotten very used to it and it suits my spinning preferences for starting off uh, with an empty spindle. I quite like stone because it's dense and that makes it heavy and I'm very fond of relatively heavy spindles. Oh, this is another thing. A lot of people think that if you have a heavy spindle, you can only spin thick yarn. And that is definitely not true. You can spin relatively thin yarn with a heavy spindle. So actually uh, the only thing that uh, the weight of the spindle will really dictate is how strong your thread is. And I call this a running quality control. Because if you have a spindle that weighs, say, 50 grams and you can have a large wall, that means that you can have about 50 grams or 60 or 70 or even more, then at any point in time, your thread will hold that weight. So you know your thread will stand a tension of, say, 50 grams. And this is really important if you spin for weaving. Because if you sell a thread to the weaver and it breaks on the loom, that is very annoying and that weaver will not buy thread from you ever again. When your thread breaks during spinning, you just fix it on and spin on. And yes, that's a bit annoying, but it's no big deal at all. So um, if you're spinning, try out some heavy weights. Just try how fine you can go with your thread. I would bet that you will be really, really surprised. And um, this is also a nice thing about these medieval spindle sticks. You can basically stick anything on them that has a hole in it that is less than about a centimeter wide. So. Um, we're nearing the end of my demo time. And uh, I hope I could answer your questions and did not miss any of them. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're interested in medieval spinning, as I said, check out my, my website. Uh, it's palia.net. You can also find the link in the bio of my profile. I have all kinds of things. I have starter packs when you want to get started with medieval spinning with uh, instructions with three different kinds of wool in them. Uh, instructions are available in German and in English. I have distaffs, which are very nifty 
to use. Uh, if you live in a country that has insanely high shipping fees, I also have a make your own this stuff kit with the band, nails and instructions. So you can make your own with your own favorite piece of wood. Um, and uh, this, the little helper card as well in the shop, if you are interested in that. And yeah, a lot of other funny things I hope will bring you joy in your spinning. Thank you very much. And I hope to see you somewhere once this pandemic is over, maybe at some demonstration in real life.